Miss Barbary for sharing that with us to, today. I'm going to ask you if you would to turn with me, please, in your Bibles to the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 25. I want to continue on there. And as I said to you last week, uh, we are have been in this study now for a little while. And uh, it will... Uh, uh, just probably a few more weeks and we will at least have this wrapped up uh, as to where I won't uh, feel like the Lord wants us to be and then we'll ask the Lord to direct us uh, however he needs to uh, going forward. But I wanted to go back to chapter 25. Last Sunday morning I spoke to you on the tabernacle and uh, the meeting place with God where God had designed to meet with his people. And, uh, and I could not, uh, it, it could not at least, I wish that I had time and we could go through uh, the tabernacle uh, itself. And, and just uh, that, that in itself is, is an entire study. And uh, it might take the next, if this is taking six months, this, it might take the next six months just to be able to, uh, just to be able to finish that. And... Um, uh, there are college courses that are designed on the tabernacle alone. And uh, so there's so many significant parts and pieces uh, to it. And this morning, however, I want to speak about one of those pieces, and that is a piece of furniture that's in the tabernacle. There were six pieces of furniture that God instructed Moses to put in the tabernacle. And the very first one that he instructed and had given Moses instructions concerning was the Ark of the Covenant or the Ark of, of the Testimony uh, at his, as it is referred to. And, uh, and I want us to uh, look at that for just a few minutes this morning and see what it is the Holy Spirit wants to say to us through this. The Bible says beginning in verse 10 of chapter 25 of the book of Exodus, and they shall make an Ark of Shittim Wood, two cubics and a half, shall be the length thereof, and a cubic and a half breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, within and without shalt thou overlay it, and shalt make upon it a crown of gold around about. And thou shalt cast four rings of gold for it, and put them in the four corners thereof, and two rings shall be in the same side of it, and two rings in the other side of it. And thou shalt make staves of shittim wood, and overlay them with gold. And thou shalt put the staves into the rings by the sides of the ark, that the ark may be born with them. And the staves shall be in the rings of the ark, and they shall not be taken from it and that uh, thou shalt put uh, into the ark of the testimony which I shall give thee. So you put in the ark the testimony which I shall give thee. And notice what he says in verse 17. Thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubics and a half shall be the length thereof and a cubic and a half the breadth thereof. And thou shalt make two cherubims of gold, a beaten uh, work uh, shall thou make them in the two ends of the mercy seat. And make one cherubim on the one end and the other cherubim on the other end, even uh, the mercy seat, even of the mercy seat shall ye make the cherubims and two ends thereof. And the cherubims shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings and their faces shall look one to another. Toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubim be. And thou shalt put the mercy seat above up, upon the ark and in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. So he says that to us again. And there I shall meet with thee and I will commune with thee and from above the mercy seat from between the two cherubims which are upon the ark of testimony of all things which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. As I said to you just a few moments ago, we started last week and we talked about the tabernacle and we know that it was designed not by Moses, but it was designed and the plan 
was given by God. And he gave Moses this plan. And just to give you a brief description, again, I'm not trying to beat a dead horse, but just in case somehow you missed it last time so that we all have some sense or some idea of what we're talking about. The tabernacle was really a tent. I mean, that's what it was. It was a tent. As a matter of fact, the tabernacle itself was a just, uh, it, as far as dimensions are concerned, it was 45 feet long and 15 feet wide and 15 feet high. And it was divided into two rooms. There was the holy place and there was the most holy place. So it wasn't that the tabernacle itself was that big of a place, but that was it. But surrounding the tabernacle, and when you look at the pictures, and if I'd, we were to put a picture up today or we planned to do that, you would see that there was a a cloth-like fence uh, that was around the tabernacle. And uh, surrounding the tabernacle was this fence which was 150 feet long and 75 feet wide. And it made a sizable courtyard that was around the tabernacle itself. And, uh, and so, you know, there were many people that were able to go into the courtyard. But just because you could go into the courtyard area didn't mean that you could actually go into the tabernacle itself. That was, that was a duty that was for the priest. They were the ones that were, were to do that work and were given that authority according to God and according to the Scriptures. As I said, there were six pieces of furniture that were associated with the tabernacle. I mentioned them in passing on last week. One of them, of course, is mentioned first. I just read to you about the Ark of the Covenant or the Ark of the Testimony, as it is referred to here. And, uh, and aside from that, though, there were some other pieces. For instance, uh, there was, um, uh, there was uh, in these these six pieces, you had the laver, you had, you had other things that, that obviously that were there and, and uh, we won't get into all of that this morning, but, but they were all there for a purpose and God had a design for each one of them. But when we come to this, this piece, this uh, Ark of the Covenant that is mentioned here, I, wanna, I want us to, to dwell on that for just a moment because uh, it, it has significance all by itself. Uh, the other pieces do as well. And I'm not trying to, uh, you know, where the, the table of showbread, the golden candlestick, all of, all of the other pieces of furniture that we find in the tabernacle, they have significance, but I don't, any, none of them have quite the significance of the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the, Ark of the Covenant or the Ark of Testimony was a wooden chest. And it was... 45 inches long. Now, we're basing all of this off of the fact that according to what we know from the Bible, a cubic would be somewhere around 18 inches. So uh, it is, it's 45 inches long and it was 27 inches wide and it was 27 inches high. And there was a lid that was placed on that box and the lid that was placed on that box was called the mercy seat. And attached to that lid was two cherubims. And they were facing each other and they covered uh, the lid with their wings. And the faces of the cherubims looked down at the mercy seat. That's what we just read just a moment ago. That they looked down at the mercy seat. Uh, the box was made of wood covered with gold. This particular wood, the Shittim wood that we read about here, was, would have been a, a very durable wood. It, was, it wouldn't have been one that would have easily rotten. And uh, it would have been something that would have been durable and lasting. And so that's the reason that it was chosen. And it was to be covered with gold. 
the cherubims that were made were solid gold. And all of this has significance for us because it, it teaches us some things. For instance, look again with me at what the Bible says, uh, what the Bible says here beginning in verse number 10. The Bible says, as we talk about for a moment, the construction, and that's what we're dealing with, the construction of the Ark of, of the Covenant. When we start dealing with the construction of it, when the Lord said, I want you to make an Ark of Shittim wood, two cubics and a half shall be the length, which I, I said a moment ago, 45 inches long. And he goes on and he talks about, uh, he says that uh, it, it shall be a, a cubic and a half breadth thereof and a cubic and a half in height. So 27 inches wide and 27 inches high and he tells us about it. He says, I want it to be overlaid with gold, verse 11, within and without. And, and, uh, and he said that you're to, to make upon it a crown of gold around about it. And, uh, and, and he also gives the, how they're to make the rings and the staves that they'll insert into it that one day when, it, when, when they have to move and move the Ark of the Covenant, that they can carry it. But all of this is significant because, significant because it, it reminds us and it tells us some things and it speaks to us some things I think that's very uh, important for us to know this morning. Uh, for instance, I think when we look at this, we know that the ark of, uh, represented the power and the authority of God. It represented... Uh, the, the power and authority of God there in the camp of Israel. It, it represented His presence. And uh, we, we know that. We know that later on uh, when uh, the ark was taken, remember? Uh, when, when Eli was the priest there at Shiloh and the ark was taken and the Bible says that the glory departed. Remember when when uh, when the ark was gone and Israel, the God's presence was no longer with them and God's presence was no longer there. Uh, that they, they said that the glory had departed. The glory was gone. So it was very significant. It was a significant piece of furniture and it, it, it meant something for them. It was, it was God said, I, I'm going to commune with you there. I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to meet with you there, but I, I'm going to commune with you there. There's something significant about it. When we go through the scriptures, we find that the ark had many names. I've been referring to it as the ark of the covenant, which is referred to in the book of Numbers, chapter 10 and verse 33. It was also called the ark of God. That's the one I was making reference to just a moment ago in 1 Samuel 3 and 3 when it was taken from the temple there at Shiloh. And, uh, and then or, or the, the place there at Shiloh, the, there's the ark of the Lord that is referred to in the book of Joshua. It's the ark of the Lord God in 1 Kings chapter 2. It's the ark of testimony here that we have in chapter 25 that we've been reading about this morning. It's the holy ark and the ark of God's strength. That's the way the psalmist records. So it, there's a lot of ways that it's referred to in the Bible, but the bottom line is, is that it reminds us of God's presence and not only does it remind us of God's presence, but it represents Jesus Christ. The ark itself, remember I said that it was wood, but it was also gold that it was overlaid with gold. It's all type and shadow of the Lord Jesus and His coming. It's, it reminds us of the fact that Jesus Christ was human. The wood speaks of His humanity. But the gold that it was overlaid with speaks of His deity. The fact that He was human and yet divine. And remember, when we think about God that way and we think about Jesus Christ becoming a man, we have to remember that he became a man according to the scriptures. I gave you this verse last week and we were, we were centering in on that verse where the Bible says that he dwelt among us. But let's look at it again in, in John chapter 1 in verse 14 and look at what he says there to us again when he talks to us about the Word. He said the Word was made flesh. Notice that. We dwelt, la no pun intended there, we dwelt last week on that word dwelt dwelt among us. That word dwelt means tabernacled among us. He, he, tab he pitched a tent. 
And he tabernacled among us. But this morning, I want us to look at that again where it says, And the Word was made flesh. The Word was already in existence. There was never a time when the Word was not there, but the Word was made flesh. The Bible doesn't say the Word was made or Jesus was made. It says Jesus was made flesh. So Jesus was born he was born on this earth. He was born as a man. But I want you to remember that in becoming a man, he never ceased to be God. He never gave up his deity. He never gave up uh, the divine part of himself. He was always God. He was the God-man or is the God-man. And so he's, he's flesh, yes, but he's, and he's man, yes, but he's God. He became a man but never ceased to be God. So the first thing we do when we look at the ark and we look at its construction, we see a real picture of Jesus and how Jesus Christ became a man, but he never ceased to be God. And the ark is pointing them and it points to the fact that Jesus Christ is coming and, uh, and the significance of having his presence and all that he can offer and what he will do uh, is, is beyond what we can comprehend this morning. But the second thing that I want to mention to you very quickly today happens to deal with the contents of, that was to be put into the ark. And our text, our text tells us, and we read it at least twice, but let me show it to you one time here in verse 16, and I think it's again in verse, I believe it's in verse number 21, but verse 16, the Bible says, And thou shalt put into the ark the testimony which I shall give thee. You'll put into the ark the testimony which I shall give thee. Now the testimony that he's talking about there is the two tablets of stone. And we know what was on those tablets of stone. Moses had been up on Mount Sinai and while he was up on Mount Sinai, remember he had received, not only did he receive the layout for the tabernacle which he's involved in now, but just before that, God had given him the Ten Commandments. He had given him the law. He had given him the covenant of the law. And, uh, and everything that they needed to function and be functional as a nation and, uh, and to be able to live with him uh, in a relationship with him and with each other. And that's why we have, we have those commandments that we have. But he had given them these, those ten commandments. And he says to them to take and put the, the testimony... Uh, which I give you and put it inside of the ark. So, so these, these tables that they put inside of the ark uh, speak of, of, of the law and they remind us of some things about the Lord Jesus. They tell us some things about Him. They tell us, of course, of the fact that uh, we know that Jesus was, obedience, or was obedient and the law speak of the obedience of Christ. Christ's obedience was well expressed. We, we've seen him live it out in the scriptures when we read about him in Matthew and Mark and Luke and John and even the psalmist himself who was writing about Christ and when Christ was come, come he, he, as Christ would have said it in the book of Psalms, he said this, he said, I, I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. In other words, is typified by the fact that it was inside the ark. So Jesus Christ would fulfill the law. So Moses, God said, Moses, I want you to put the law in the ark. I want the law inside of the ark. I want you to put my law in there because uh, if, if you're going to have a relationship with me and, and we're going to be able to be together and commune together, uh, then you're, you're, going to have to, you're going to have to be obedient and the law has to be represented and the truth has to be represented. And, uh, and, and so God, God wanted to be sure that that was part of it. But the Bible goes on and it also tells us about some other components that were placed into the ark. As a matter of fact, the Hebrew writer, I think, sums it up and says it best in Hebrews chapter 9 in verse number 4. He talks about the ark and he says, The ark of the covenant was overlaid around about with gold just what I had just read to you just a moment ago. And he tells us what was inside the ark also. 
the Bible says that there was also at some point added the golden pot, which was the golden pot that had manna. And not only was it the golden pot that had manna, but Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant, the very thing that I'm talking to you about this morning here, the law. The law was the first part that was added. And then at some later time, this golden pot of manna was added. This was manna that had been gathered and it was, it was no doubt uh, a very important part of, of what God wanted them to remember about himself and, and not just about himself, but it was again a sign or a signal of, of the Lord Jesus Christ and it typified Jesus. You wonder why some of this is included in the ark and why the significance of it all. This is it. When we talk about this pot of manna, remember manna by definition is what is it? When the, when the children of Israel went out and they began to look on the ground and they saw the manna that was given to them, that, that heavenly bread, and, uh, and they gave it the name manna because they, they're the ones that said, well, what is it? And that's what manna means. What is it? And uh, they didn't know what it was. They'd never been fed from heaven before like that. God fed them, as we said, bread from heaven and he fed them meat from heaven, quail from heaven in the evenings, but they said, what is it? And I think that's interesting because uh, it really has no set definition. I think that's interesting today. I think that ought to be interesting for us in the sense that, that the Lord Jesus Christ, when we begin to think about him and we begin to think about his declaration, remember what Jesus said? Jesus said it in John chapter 6, and I'm going to speak from John chapter 6 tonight, as a matter of fact, in a little bit of a different way. But, but in John chapter 6, Jesus made this declaration in verse 32. He said to them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven. He said, But my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. And he goes on and he says, For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. And notice this. He said, and then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And notice what he said in verse 35. He said, I am the bread of life. He that cometh unto me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. So Jesus Christ when they put this golden pot of manna inside of the ark at some point later, I know they didn't do it just right on when God was giving Moses these instructions. It happened at a later time. But when they put that golden pot of manna in there, what they were doing is they were placing inside of the ark of the covenant something that was symbolic of the bread of life. It was symbolic of Jesus Christ, that he's the life-giving son of God that he's the one that gives us life. He's the life giver. He brings fulfillment like no other. And someone said, well, isn't it strange that they, they would put that pot of manna in there, that what is it inside of it? And it just bears out the fact that whatever you need Jesus Christ to be, whatever he needs to be in your life, in my life, he can be that this morning. He can do it. That's who he is. But the, the significance is, that he's the life-giving son of God and he gives life and he's the bread of life and, uh, and, and he brings fulfillment and, and he's whatever you and I need him to be. And so they were to, they were to put that pot of manna in that golden pot of manna inside of the ark. But the Bible also says that another time, a later time, they added a rod it wasn't just any rod. I'm sure there were many among the company of the Israelites who had rods or staffs, but it was the rod of Aaron. And it was significant because the rod of Aaron did something that no other rod had done. To find that story, you have to go back and go over to the book of Numbers. And if you'll allow me for just a moment, I'd like to talk about it and just kind of give you a brief synopsis of it. And then we can, uh, we can make the application here. 
In the book of Numbers chapter 16 and 17, those are the two chapters that you can find and you can read about Aaron's rod that was blooming. The Bible tells us that there were some men, three of them in particular, that rose up in rebellion against Moses and Aaron. Those three men were men by the name of Korah and, uh, and Dathan and Abiram. Those three men were men that had traveled up the mountain with Moses to a certain point. And uh, they were Levites, so they were of the, the priestly order. They had assignments already. God, God had uh, given them assignments there in the tabernacle. And uh, they were assisting the priests. But God had chosen Aaron to be the first high priest. He was to be the the high priest. He was the one that was to go into the, into the Holy of Holies and he was the one to take the blood and he would be the one that would offer, offer the blood on behalf of the, the sins of the people once a year when the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies and do what God had instructed him to do. But they rose up in rebellion against Aaron and Moses. And they said that Moses and Aaron were not the only two holy people in the camp. They felt like they were just as holy as they were. And they decided that they wanted to exercise some authority and they wanted more power. And so they, they began to rise up in rebellion against Moses and Aaron. If you read what the Bible says in Numbers chapter 16 in particular, the Bible says that Moses fell down on his knees. He was so taken back by what was going on that he fell down on his knees and pleaded with them. Realizing, knowing what they were doing and what they were entering into, that, that what was about to happen and what was going to take place certainly would not make God happy. And he was heartbroken. Moses, that is, was just heartbroken over what these men were doing. But they insisted, they insisted. And so Moses went, and the Bible says that he went to the tent of meeting and, uh, and he heard from God. And God said there were 250 of them that were with, with these, three rebel, these three rebels, Korah and Datham and Abiram. And, uh, and God said, he said, we're going to put an end to this. We'll just put an end to it. We'll stop it. And, uh, and so uh, he told Moses, said, tell the people to stand back. Stand away from their tents. When they, they went, uh, had all come together and gathered together there but at the tent of meeting, uh, they were from a, a distance away. And he said, tell all of them to stand, the people to stand back. And the Bible says that Moses gave them warning and told them what to do. And the Bible says that Moses came out and began to talk to him and said to him, said, now, said, if, if you die some natural way, in essence, and I'm paraphrasing, but if, if you die some natural way, you'll know that it's not God that has spoken to me. But if the earth opens up and swallows you, you'll know, you'll know that God has spoken and that God has given instruction Aaron is to be the high priest and he has assigned us and given us these roles that we're in. And about the time he said those words, if you read the Bible very carefully, the Bible says that the earth broke open and it swallowed, literally it swallowed these three, Korah and Datham and Abiram. It swallowed them alive. They were they were buried alive. They died alive. They, they, were, they were swallowed up and died alive, so to speak. While they were yet living, the earth come to on them and, and literally just took them out. And then God took 250 more out that were siding with them. The glory of the Lord and his presence took them out. And would you believe you would think that would have convinced the people, right? You would have think that that would have been enough. But some of them still came to Moses later and they said to him, said, listen, they, they were troubled and they were, they were complaining that, 
that God had killed some of them. And they were still having their disagreement. And the Bible says that Moses, God wanted to take care of those people too. But Moses and Aaron interceded for them. Moses and Aaron went in before the Lord and interceded on their behalf. And God gave them a plan. This is how they would know that Aaron was to be the high priest, the staff, the rod that budded. And the verse that we have up before us you find in chapter 17 of the book of Numbers. The Bible says it came to pass that on the morrow Moses went into the tabernacle of witness and behold the rod of Aaron for the house of Levi was budded and notice not only did it bud but the Bible says that it brought forth buds and it bloomed blossoms and not only did it bloom blossoms but it yielded almonds. I want you to try that on for just a moment. We're talking about a dry, dead stick. That's all we're talking about. We're talking about a stick. It's a dry stick. It's a rod. It's dead. It's not green. It's not life producing. It's not a piece of wood that's growing out here with roots deep down in the ground, but it's something that's been cut off. It's something that's been cut down. It's something that's no longer alive. It, it has no attachment to any root system. And yet, it's budding. And not only is it budding, but it's blossoming. And not only is it blossoming, but it's producing fruit. It's giving forth something that it could not do. What does that say? Why would that even be something that needed to be placed into the ark of the ark of God or the ark of the covenant or the ark of testimony. Why would we want to put that in there? Why was that something that God would want to be included in there? I tell you why. Because it reminds us of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It reminds us that Jesus Christ lived, yes, but Jesus died. It reminds us of the fact that they put him in a borrowed tomb and they sealed up that tomb because he was dead. But on the third and appointed day and on the third and appointed morning, hallelujah, he came out of the grave victorious over death, hell and the grave, hallelujah. He was dead, but he's alive. And look at the fruit that has come from it. Look at what's been produced since that time. That's why. That's why it was included in there. Because Jesus lives by the power of an endless life so we can have everlasting life and we too can be fruitful before God. That's why. That's why. So all of it points to Jesus. All of, us, all of it reminds us of Jesus. And when we look at the significance of the Ark of the, uh, of the Testimony, the Ark of the Covenant, of the Ark, it all brings and reminds us of Jesus. But let me give you one last thing. I'm through, I promise. One last thing. Not only do we have the construction, not only do we see the contents, but here's the last thing. We got the communion. Look at it with me, please. In your Bibles again, I want you to look at verse 21. What the Lord said, the Lord said, and thou shalt put the mercy seat upon the ark, above and upon the ark, and the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I give thee. So on the top, you're going to have the mercy seat. And remember inside, he said, you're going to put the law. Now, I know those other things were added later. But right now, we're just dealing with those two things. The mercy seat's on top. And he said, I want you to put the law in. The other two were added, the golden pot of manna, Aaron's rod that budded, that was added at a later date or a later time. But at this moment and this time, he said, put the law of the testimony inside. And notice what he said in verse 22, and I'll meet with you. And he said, not only will I meet with you, but I'll commune with you above the mercy seat. I'll commune with you above the mercy seat. Now listen to me. The location of God in the tabernacle was specifically stated as being above the mercy seat. I'll meet with you above the mercy seat above the mercy seat. 
As, and, 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 and we know that the mercy seat was the lid, really. It was the seat which was on, which was solid gold, and it was it had the same dimensions uh, that we've talked about already. And uh, and we know that it had these two cherubim, angelic beings there, in the presence of God, whose wings fanned to, toward one another and barely tipped one another. And that was what we call the mercy seat. At some point in Scripture later, it's called the throne of God. It, it, it becomes that, the, the throne which God dwells. But the cherubim are seen as providing the footstool of God's throne. And God's presence is such that it's never visible. That's why I'm, I'm, I'm firm in my belief. And, uh, and you know, and if I'm wrong, I'm just wrong. That's all right. It won't matter then or anyway. But I've told you so many times about what I heard explained about the Trinity, talking about God, Father, God, Son, God, Holy Spirit. God, Father is the only one we'll know. God, when we get to heaven, God, Son is the only God we'll see. God, Holy Spirit is the only God we'll feel. Not three gods, just one God. Manifest himself in those ways. But God's presence in this case, it was, it was never visible. His presence was invisible, but the cherubim represented the resting place of God, the throne of God. God said, I'll meet with you. And he said, here's where I'm going to meet with you. I'm going to meet with you above the mercy seat. I'm going to meet with you above the mercy seat. Oh, that's significant. That says something. And not only does that say something to us, but what else it tells us is this. Remember what, I, what it says to us? It says that under the mercy seat inside the ark at this point was the law. So on the top you have the mercy seat and it's covered. It's covering what's under the law. But listen to me. Once a year the high priest, he would go into where the mercy seat was and as I said a moment ago, underneath the lid of the mercy seat were the tablets of law. And over it was the mercy seat. And the blood of the sacrifice was sprinkled upon the wings of the cherubim, upon the mercy seat. And the reason that it was done that way was so that the law that had been broken might be atoned for by means of of blood. The law which was in the Ark of the Covenant demanded, it demanded God's truth. It demanded God's law. It demanded that whoever had to live up to God's expectation. If the nation of Israel and the people of Israel couldn't live up to it, and there was no mercy given, there was no, there was no, no forgiveness given, then they were in trouble. Because if all you have is the law, the law tells you what's wrong. The law says that you, you didn't do this right and you didn't do that right, but the law can't fix you or me. The law can just tell us that we're wrong. The law can show us how unlike Jesus we are and how much more like Jesus we need to be or how unlike God we are and how much more like God we need to be. But, but the mercy seat which was over it spoke of the fact that God would give grace and God would give forgiveness to his people. That he would give grace and he would give forgiveness to his people and, and, and who had broken the law. So therefore, at the very, listen, at the very center of Israel's experience was the fact that God most clearly manifested both his love and truth and his grace. And there on the mercy seat, truth and grace met together. Hallelujah. Truth and grace met together. No wonder, remember that verse of scripture we had a few moments ago? No wonder, no wonder the Bible says that when it talks about, remember what it said about Jesus in John chapter one and verse 14? 
Can we find that again? I don't know if we can. We, we're, we're long beyond it. But in chapter 14 and verse 1, do you know what the Bible says? The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father. Notice this, full of grace and truth. Full of grace and truth. That's who Jesus is. He's full of grace and He's full of truth. And when we look at the mercy seat, God met them there at grace and truth. And so, because of God's grace, and because of His mercy, the people could come and they could meet with God. And they had access to God. And today we have access to God and into God's presence through the blood of Jesus Christ. I tell you, He is, he is our mercy seat. Jesus Christ is my mercy seat. <laughs> Hallelujah. You know what John said? John said it this way in 1 John 2 and 2. Miss Evelyn's coming to play for me. John said that he is the propitiation for our sins. But he's not, he's not only the, my, the propitiation for my sin. In other words, he's the atonement for our sins. But not for ours only but also for the sins of the whole world. Hallelujah. Nobody has to be cut off from God. Nobody has to be excluded. Nobody has to be put out. Nobody has to be alienated. Nobody has to be cut off. Nobody has to give an excuse and say, I can't approach God. I can't come to God. I'm too unholy. I've broken too many laws. I've done too many wrong things. I, I just, I can't, I can't do it, Pastor. I, 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 I'm just a mess. I, my life's a mess. I, I, there's just too much wrong with me to be able to go to God. That isn't what the Bible says. God said, I'll meet with you at the mercy seat. I'll meet with you at the mercy seat. I'll commune with you at the mercy seat. And I want to tell you, Jesus Christ, not only is he, not only is he the one, not only was he the sacrifice who gave his blood, and he's the high priest, the great high priest who took his blood. And he's the great high priest who sprinkled it on the mercy seat. And he is the mercy seat. You say, Pastor, I, I, I think you're losing me. I think I've lost myself. I don't know that I can follow all of it either, but all I know is that Jesus Christ is everything we need. He's everything we need. And if you want to approach God and you want to come to God and you want to go to God, He's the only way. The only way. You know, I thought about it and I didn't give these verses for the screen and it's all right. I thought about, though, what the, the Hebrew writer said. The Hebrew writer said this. A pretty familiar verse of Scripture found in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 10. Or excuse me, verse 16. He said this. He said, let us therefore come boldly. Let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace. That's the mercy seat. And he said that we can obtain mercy and we can find grace to help in our time of need. We can come without shame. We can come without being afraid and ashamed that we're weak and we're feeble and that we're human. God said, Moses, I want you to put this in the tabernacle. And I want it to be the first thing you do because that's center to everything else that's going to have to take place in your life and my life. We've got to have Jesus right. And if we don't have Jesus right, you can't get everything else right if Jesus is not right. I, do, I see people, I listen to people. I listen to people all the time and they're, they're scrambling around trying to figure out what to do and how to do and 
and and I, I had someone telephone me just the other day. I, I I was Friday evening, and I won't go into any detail. And the lady on the phone was just in tears, and she was crying. She said, "Pastor, pray, pray, pray." And my first thought is. I know there are other problems and I know there are other things. But the first place, the starting place, is Jesus right in our life. If we can get that part right, then He can help us with some of these other things. But that's got to be the starting place. The starting place. Would you stand with me? Father, we thank you this morning for your goodness and we thank you for your grace. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege today to hear your word and to be here and to be in this place. I pray today, God, that you would help us. I pray, Lord, that you would just speak to our hearts. However, whatever we need to do and how we need to respond, I pray, oh God, that you would help us. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're here this morning, you've never given your heart and life to the Lord. Maybe you're here this morning, you say, Pastor, I just I just need to get some things straight. I need Jesus to help me get some things straight. And the starting place is with you. tell you, he wants preeminence in your life. I don't think it was an accident that God, that God told Moses, Moses, I want you to put the ark in first. That wasn't an accident. God knew how important it was that we have him. Because if we don't have him, and he's not helping us and directing us, what do we have? So you're here this morning need to find a place to pray. Whatever you need to do, would you come? Come just as you Thank you for being here. I'll see you tonight, the Lord will.